Buongiorno. Benvenuti. So good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to this third meeting of this cycle on uh, uh, an era of change, crisis as a passage. This is a series curated by Luciano Violante for seeing three encounters, three meetings, one uh, held by Luciano Velante on the institutional, general institutional change, the second by Professor Di Libacci on demography, and the third one. Today, we're going to talk about the economy and an era of change. So economies and changing times. For those of you who have not followed this fil rouge, uh, what we want to talk about is uh, the fact that we are in a moment of change. Also, Pope Francis said that we are in a moment of change. We cannot only think about what's changing day after day, but we are in a moment of radical change in our society. President Violante was talking about the end of ideologies and of an idea of the state and the relationship between the citizen, citizens and the state that has lasted for many years. Libacci, starting from uh, the population topic, focused on the fact that we are experiencing a big migration uh, flow, certainly not the first in the course of history but a very relevant migration flow at a world level that certainly modifies and changes uh, lifestyles. First of all, we are witnessing a change in population from 3 billion to 6 billion to uh, 10 billion inhabitants in the world with uh, massive uh, migration flows between continents. And this is also a uh, uh, these are also changing times when it comes to the economy. Uh, suffices to think about uh, the financial crisis, uh, the globalization that came before, as well as technological change. We are no longer witnessing the short period, but we are going through a very long period which becomes uh, obsolete in just uh, uh, in a limited period of time. There are countries that were considered to be part of the third world when I was little and which now rank among the most important and powerful economies in the world. What does these, what do these changing times impose on us? Can we go on looking at life and looking at politics only within the framework of a legislature? Or should we start having a new point of view on this? This evening with us, we have a major and outstanding speaker, Mr. Ignazio Visco, the governor of the Bank of Italy. Because of his institutional role, and not only because of that, he is someone who can definitely give a useful contribution. And plus, the Bank of Italy is probably the most important cultural venue that we have in Italy when it comes to this structural economic thinking that uh, is uh, uh, does not stop with this period. So thank you very much. Thanks to Ignazio Visco for being with us. He's going to hold a lecture, and then there will be a question to complete the evening. So thank you, Governor. You have the floor. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. Thanks to Emilia Guarnieri. Thanks to Professor Vitteradini. Thanks to Professor Violante, who asked me to uh, participate in this context. I'm going to talk about a very important topic. We are living in an era of change. Uh, so are we living in an era of change, or are we undergoing a change? Uh, are we undergoing changing times? The world has changed radically over the last 25 years, globalization and the radical exchange in uh, uh, goods and services after the opening of the markets, technological change with the emergence of new technologies, not only ICT, but also technologies in other venues, then digitalization, all this has had uh, uh, great terrific effects. And as a matter of fact, uh, I'm using the iPad, and this is just uh, 
to exemplify what I am saying. And this has taken place within the context of uh, uh, a rapid population growth. Professor Vittadini uh, mentioned, has just mentioned this, and also Professor Ilibachi talked about that. The population uh, was 5 billion in 1990 and 7.5 billion today. Only 300 years ago, the world population was less than 800 million people. One, uh, 0.5 billion inhabitants at the beginning of the 20th century, about 3 billion inhabitants about 50 years ago, 5 billion inhabitants 25 years ago, and now we have 10 billion people. This, in spite of this, well-being uh, well can be measured with per capita income and also with another parameter like, for example, life expectancy. It can be measured by considering the reduction in child mortality. Well, well-being has increased at the same time. Furthermore, in Europe, we've had remarkable, we've witnessed remarkable change over the last 25 years, especially new economic and monetary union and a single monetary policy. These changes have repercussions also when it comes to the organization of the economy and to the ability of companies to compete. This change does not only take place in a linear way, it is not only a linear change and still today we are uh, we have to come to terms with the effects of the financial crisis uh, of uh, the 1920s, and uh, still today we are facing the difficulties of the financial crisis of 2008. I'm not going to talk about the deep crisis that Italy found itself in over the last 10 years. I've talked about that at the end of May, and I tried to convey my own message, based on which this has been the most, uh, the hardest crisis in the history of our country, the deepest one. It has been far worse than the Big Depression, and this had effects on public finance, on banks. So what we see and read in the papers uh, uh, is the result is the direct effect of this crisis. This then led to unemployment. It led to the shutting down of uh, several companies. Uh, and we are still trying to get out of this crisis. Uh, even if we have to say that uh, the recovery has just started, it is uh, linked to the current situation. And this kind of recovery has taken place thanks to the reforms, current reforms. Reforms uh, still have to be completed. Much still has to be done in this respect. But we are recovering. This crisis has hit our economy in a moment when uh, uh, the economy itself was uh, uh, making up uh, for the um, extensive delays it uh, had suffered before in trying to keep pace in fields like globalization, digitalization, etc. And these changes are social, economic, demographic, technological, as well as political changes. And we, so the companies, the, uh, the banks, politics in general, vis-a-vis -vis these changes, uh, all of these players have been very slow to adapt. We are lagging behind in uh, adjusting uh, to these changes, but this can uh, explain us a lot vis-a-vis uh, -vis the crisis. The crisis we suffered was a financial crisis, and it also led us to debate the role of finance. Some people believe it is a good force, it is a good element for development to proceed, Others believe that the banking activity is morally dubious, as others think. But I would like to start with globalization. The term globalization refers to the increasing unification of world markets. 
this was determined especially with the end of the Cold War. Many of you are young. You probably did not live through the years of the Cold War. My generation actually did not think that the socialist system of Eastern Europe would collapse in such a rapid way. Undoubtedly, however, there was a dividend paid by peace. And we expected this peace dividend to bring about positive effects for everybody, for us in the West, for us who are on the good side, so to say, who would have had the chance to communicate and, uh, and trade with economies uh, that, were, that would start opening up. As a matter of fact, new protagonists emerged, emerging economies emerged, the so-called third world, and that became, that has become our first world. Russia, South Africa, China, India, Brazil, all of them opened up, and all of us benefited from this unification of the markets. Trade increased exponentially, and people started moving, not so much the first time, because it was a, uh, at that time that we experienced big migration flows after, uh, at the beginning of last century, and then the same happened after the Second World War. But what's important to point out and that it was that there was this freedom of movement, uh, and there was no the possibility to go wherever it was better and wherever incentives uh, were given. So globalization brought about competitive pressures in emerging countries on the part of producers in emerging countries, uh, some of them very big like China and India, as well as in other countries which are organized more or less uh, in uh, uh, the way that OECD countries are, like South Korea. We've witnessed very important effects, for example, in a crucial system for the Italian economy, like the textile or the footwear sector or the leather sector. In this sector, in just 20 years, we registered an increase of the Chinese share of 25%. China has achieved about 45% of the world pop production. And at the same time, the production of Italian companies fell by about 35, 36% in these 20 years, much more than uh, the percentage of the entire productive sector, which lost about 16% of the total. So globalization and technological progress uh, can uh, feed each other reciprocally. They are necessary to manage the fragmentation of production in a world context. And the possibility and the capability of participating in global value chain is also very important. Similarly important is to, in a way, divide productive tasks uh, and the manufacture of goods that are traded with, with delocalization. This brings about uh, the uh, possibility for us to take advantage as much as possible of, uh, of this reduction of costs. So globalization is most of the times identified uh, because of the increase in importance of emerging economies. They contributed to world growth with a percentage that has been about 70% of the last years. It was it used to be 30% in the 1970s. So 70% of uh, the world's growth depends on emerging economies. It takes place in emerging economies. So you can see from the slide uh, that uh, the weight of uh, uh, countries with a medium to low uh, income reduced considerably and also the increased considerably 
I beg your pardon, and the weight and the importance of countries of the so-called advanced economies diminished. This is a way to, in a way, compare economies that have different uh, levels of uh, development, but even the, the, the picture would not be so different even if we used uh, current exchange rates. Uh, so the share of the world GDP for medium to low income countries uh, would be 54 percent, uh, and it would, be, it would have increased to 46 percent. So we're still talking about high percentages. Uh, This is mainly due to the uh, remarkable increase in trade uh, of goods and services worldwide with these countries, uh, and especially uh, of the percentage of products that are exported. We are talking about 30% of what is currently being produced, which is currently being exported in the world. Also, foreign direct investments have been very high. We went from $10 billion in 1970 to a higher value. Today, the investment flows going towards other countries are over 2,000 billion, 3,000 uh, billion uh, slightly before the financial crisis. We're talking uh, about a shift from 10 to 2,000 billion. Euros, so as just to give you an idea of the flows abroad uh, from the individual countries. So globalization and the technological progress and technological progress which lie at the basis of uh, the extraordinary improvement of our living standards. The whole world benefited from this over the last 25 years. In real terms, the per capita GDP increased by 70% between 1990 and 2016. And this increase, uh, is a world increase, and yet also the uh, countries with the lowest income benefited from this increase. The most important result lies in poverty reduction. So the objective of reducing, of halving the percentage of people in extreme poverty, in other words, with an income lower than $1.9 as measured by the World Bank, was achieved five years in advance in 2010 compared to the initial forecasts and compared to the Millennium Development Goals agreed upon 15 years ago by the United Nations. Recent estimates uh, state that for the first time poverty has went below 10 percent of the population. In other words, extreme poverty affects less than 10 percent of the world population. We're talking about 700 million people, 9.6 percent of the world population. Now our objective is to, uh, in a way, uh, zero this percentage, zero this number of extreme poor by 2030. Out of the 1.3 billion people that have uh, gone out from a situation of extreme poverty, 1.1 percent between 1990 and 2015, and now it's 1.2 billion people, this group of people also, uh, besides this group of people, we have uh, uh, additional 2 billion people living in the world, and these 2 billion, additional 2 billion people are not extreme poor, so 3 a uh, billion out of the initial five uh, who are no longer extreme poor people. And this is really a great result. This uh, adds on to the improvement of life expectancy, the halving uh, of uh, child mortality, which is about 43 per thousand children out of the 60 per thousand of 60 years ago. Progress was made in Europe, in Italy as well, after the Second World War. Uh, one example of this is uh, the fight against uh, uh, illiteracy. Illiteracy, the illiteracy rate was very high in Italy, over five to six million people. That is to say, 13% of the population uh, older than uh, um, uh, 13 years of age was much higher. And today, we have just 1%. What's most s severe uh, here in Italy is the so-called uh, functional illiteracy, 
or problems related to uh, doing the math, so to say, the so-called functional illiteracy. The effects of globalization and uh, technical progress uh, are not always positive for everybody. Many people in our advanced economies actually wonder if they will, uh, if they are able to maintain their jobs. These jobs are threatened by robots, as many people say. And furthermore, people wonder the extent to which finance and the big international banks play a fundamental role in determining globalization and the very same technical progress. And furthermore, uh, the gap between the very rich and the very poor is becoming wider and wider. Uh, the gap between those who are very rich and those who are very poor, even if these very poor people are not extreme poor. Some critiques have been uh, put in place and uh, some people have uh, started talking about a world in which a new empire appears to dominate, uh, stemming from the joint action of uh, globalization, technology, and finance. So the question is whether these critiques are justified or not. This question and the question related to migration flows uh, seems to show that globalization and technology and finance did not bring, have not brought about uh, positive results, but apparently uh, extreme poverty has been reduced, and so some positive effects uh, have uh, taken place. And yet, the effects of globalization and technical progress are not equally distributed uh, throughout the entire population. And this, too, will be addressed uh, by me later on. Let me now talk about some things uh, when it comes to technological progress. That's the most important uh, element of change in history. It is currently revolutionizing our lifestyles, our daily habits, uh, the very same economic systems uh, and society as a whole. So in this respect, we are at a turning point. After the first uh, era of machines, starting from the second half of the 18th century, which saw the introduction of general technologies, uh, like, for example, the steam engine, the steam machine, the engine, electrification, and so on. We are now living in the second era of machines that was defined by the digital revolution, it is defined by digital revolution, the impact of the ICTs. And this is also a result of the end of the, fur of the Cold War, because when the Cold War ended, a real stock of innovation uh, was available, produced, that had been produced before in space activities, in space defense activities. So suddenly, all these services, all this knowledge and the possibility of having new technologies were made available for scientific uses. And there's plenty of examples of this. The internet has changed telecommunications in 1991. Mobile telephony uh, drastically reduced costs. And it is now replacing, uh, uh, for example, uh, the telephone, the old telephone, uh, uh, GPS systems, uh, cameras, and so on. The typical smartphone that we have in our hands has a calculation capacity, which is 3 million uh, times higher than the first computer that appeared with a cost, at a cost, which is 225 times lower. An iPhone 4, so not the latest version, but iPhone 4, used to cost $600, and now you find it on eBay at less than 100 Well, that iPhone 4 has the same calculation uh, capacity of the uh, quickest computer, which would cost $5 million in 1975. Uh, today's smartphone, the iPhone 7, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, um, is uh, 13 centimeters long, um, weighs 128 grams, and uh, a power of calculation uh, which is equal 80,000 times uh, the, uh, that of the IBM uh, stretch of 1961, um, which weighed, uh, which weighed uh, 18 uh, tons, uh, and it cost... Uh, 10,000 uh, 10, times more than the iPhone. The first satellite for communication was uh, launched by the US in 1965. 
Today, uh, there are 400 of them. At technologies of telecommunication um, are the technologies with the uh, greatest impact on our everyday habits. Internet is um, and revolution underway, both for society and the economic system. We now live in a, a digital economy, in a digital society, and this has uh, repercussions not only on the younger people, but also on uh, the elderly people. Um, it affects everybody. Interestingly, um, in 2000, I was in Paris, and we wrote a small book titled The New Economy uh, Beyond Euphoria. Uh, many people said, okay, a new economy is just a, a short-living flame. Yet, at that time, it was possible to uh, loom and to uh, see several implications linked to the possibility to uh, carry out e-commerce between companies, between companies and uh, consumers, between private consumers, between private customers, and that's become a reality. First of all, in the European Union, the rate of families uh, having access to the internet has increased from uh, 49 to 85 percent in just 10 years, from 2006 to 2016, and from 40 to 79 percent in Italy, which was lagging behind. Um, and there is, there is 100 percent of families connected to the internet in Germany, in France, in uh, the Netherlands, and in Luxembourg. The um, growth of e-commerce is ex exponential. In the EU, the average of individuals who bought uh, services or goods online in the last three months increased by 20% in, uh, from 20% uh, from to 46% in 2016. In Italy, it is also increasing, uh, uh, although with uh, um, smaller figures. Yet Italy uh, leads when it comes to the uh, possession of uh, mobile phones from 0.5 of subscribers to mob of my mobile phones uh, to 140 in uh, 2015, from 0.2 uh, to 98 in the world, from 2.1 to uh, 118 in the US. This means that many of us have more than one subscription when it comes to mobile phones services. Italy is lagging behind when it comes to the use of uh, digital um, devices in the schools, uh, in the companies, uh, and in the offices, but we are the leaders when it comes to tweeters, uh, to, um, uh, to chatting, or to uh, sending SMS. There are still hindrances when it comes to the online operations, online transactions. Uh, there are still difficulties in uh, uh, carrying out e-commerce between various countries. Um, a couple of years ago, only um, a small rate of people carried out e-commerce uh, with uh, foreign countries. In 2015, only 7% of small and medium-sized uh, enterprises sold goods and services uh, abroad. But uh, since these figures are so little, we can expect uh, an exponential growth uh, for the future. And the completion of the digital um, coverage is one of the uh, pillars of the EU, so improving the access to uh, digital services and goods in the entire EU, creating a favourable context and equal conditions so that digital uh, networks and innovative services may uh, develop, so the, um, the broadband, which should be uh, available to all, and uh, maximising the potentials for growth. These are the objectives in Europe, and then there are many other fields, many other sectors, in which there was an extraordinary um, growth. Think about uh, air transport, for instance. Speed, security, safety, uh, lower costs, despite all the criticism that we may read, between 1970 and today, the number of passengers uh, traveling by air increased in the world from 300 million uh, people to 4 billion people. In Italy, from 7 million to 29 million with a maximum amount of 38 million before the economic crisis. So we are confronted with an epo a change of uh, era, a change of epoch. But this 
had a cost, of course. And there are costs uh, of globalization and costs of uh, technological progress advancement. One of the most important denominators uh, in uh, um, globalization is the impact on the labor market, especially in the most advanced countries. According to recent estimates, 10% of the reduction of employment in the manufacturing sector in the US between 1999 and 2011 uh, was of 600,000 uh, jobs, so 10% of reduction in the employment rate, due to the direct effect of competition with China. The indirect effect through the interconnection between various sectors leads to over 2 million jobs less, in the US only. Um, in Italy, we carried out studies between 2005 and 2007. The increase in imports uh, uh, between 1995 and 2007 um, led to the loss of 120,000 uh, jobs in Italy due to imports from China. And you need to consider that Italy is one of the major manufacturing uh, countries. But this sector tends to get reduced um, with the increase in the use of uh, automated uh, um, work. So we are uh, now around 17%. And it is, uh, it is a utopia to think that we can go back to the levels before uh, the economic crisis. But the point is that we are already experiencing the effects uh, due to the uh, direct relationship with China. If we consider the entire, um, uh, the entire uh, system and all the uh, related companies, uh, the effect was, uh, is really uh, outstanding, especially in the textile sector. The technological relationship uh, with innovation, well, is um, a difficult uh, item to be analyzed. It is very much debated in uh, economic analysis. David Ricardo, at the beginning of the past century, wrote a chapter, a uh, fundamental chapter titled On the Machines, and he stated with a pessimistic view that the discovery and the use of new machines uh, would um, be detrimental for the workers and for the economy. Uh, and uh, the um, ludism came from uh, that. So the opposition to the use of machines went hand in hand with the development of technologies. This is a non-linear uh, relation. Um, the uh, stance by John Minor Keynes is probably uh, the prevailing stance. And during the Great Depression, he wrote, we are uh, suffering from a new disease of which um, not all know the name, uh, technological Unemployment, it means unemployment caused by the discovery of new ways to save money on the use of uh, uh, work as a factor uh, at a greater speed than that um, with which new uh, jobs can be found. But it is just a temporary adjustment phase. But that was not, uh, there was no uh, technological unemployment then, but 30 years after, um, Jim Smith, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, wondered what are we going to do when the product per uh, worked hour will be uh, different uh, and almost all the products will go to just a small number of uh, owners uh, of companies, the owners of the machines, and the mass of workers will be in uh, worse conditions than they were in the past. Uh, the technological progress uh, created winners and losers, but in the long term, it has always created more jobs than the jobs it has uh, destroyed. Think about agriculture. At the beginning of the 20th century, in the US, 36% of uh, those employed were working in the agricultural sector. 2% uh, of them in the 60s. In Italy, uh, we went from 63% um, to 4%, but all the people who stopped working in the agricultural sector found uh, a job elsewhere. And uh, in the meantime, 
uh, conditions changed and so uh, there was a job for everyone, uh, even for the young people. Now the progress which led to these uh, profound changes uh, enabling to expand uh, agricultural production made it possible to develop new activities, new businesses. Some of these businesses are not even uh, imaginable. There are recent studies, one of them is very interesting. Uh, it was carried out by uh, two Oxford researchers who state that almost 50% of today's uh, jobs in the US may become um, um, automated by uh, the next 10 years. Several studies were, uh, were made in Europe, carried out in Europe, and they led to similar results, yet there were um, other estimates recently, uh, a work by the OECD uh, states that the risk of disappearance of jobs is uh, uh, of 10 percent. The problem is that there is another 30 percent of jobs which will not disappear but will remain provided that those who are engaged in those jobs profoundly change their own um, skills. Uh, to continue working and that, so they should use new uh, skills and um, and different uh, um, abilities. Now we have to say that the unemployment rate in the US, the country which was most affected by uh, globalization and technologies, is currently uh, at 4.5 percent, the lowest level of the last 30-40 years. So de facto, there was no uh, tremendous impact on uh, employment. On the other hand, the participation to the um, labor market, i.e. how many people are looking for a job and they find a job, uh, has drastically um, decreased after the financial crisis. So the verdict is still open uh, and the verdict uh, lies be behind the um, unclear uh, monetary policy of the US. Then, as I said, uh, there is an increase in the gap between the poor and the rich. This is another cost of globalization. Inequalities, uh, which led to uh, the same concerns uh, uh, than those that we experienced in the 1960s. Uh, Piketty, for instance, uh, and other economists uh, which is also titled The Capital. Well, undoubtedly, we cannot ignore the effect of these great uh, changes and it is necessary to compensate those who are the most damaged by these changes. And this has not been done. And this can explain the uh, opposition uh, which is uh, um, expressed by many political forces and citizens against globalization and against uh, the opening up of markets, uh, against technological uh, advances. Uh, and undoubtedly, the figures of global inequality uh, referred to richness, to the wealth, are really impressive. In 2010, there were 388 uh, billionaires in the world um, possessing the same wealth and the same richness than that possessed by 3.1 billion poorest people. In 2015, uh, this number uh, was reduced to 62 last year, or eight of them. Eight billionaires own the same wealth, the same region of 3.5 billion people. This is an inequality uh, effect which raises concerns and it is no consolation thinking about the inequality of wage at global level has decreased over the last few years thanks to the fact that the emerging countries have grown, a lot, have grown a lot, and I'm referring to China and India. This reduction of inequalities between countries was accompanied by a strong increase in inequality in wages and wealth within most countries. For instance, 
vis-à-vis uh, 10% -vis of the population of the US with an average uh, wage, which is almost nine times higher than the rest of than the remaining 90%, we have the famous 1% of the population in the US having an average uh, wage uh, income uh, of 40 times higher than the one of the poorest uh, people. And the superstars of sports and new technologies or uh, large banks, not 0.1%, um, have an average income of 200 times vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, that of the uh, poorest uh, uh, citizens. This led to a strong increase of the wage differential between the skilled uh, occupations and the least skilled occupations, um, enabling to uh, replace with uh, uh, machines uh, the uh, workers carrying out the standardized uh, uh, operations. In addition to that, the society will be also uh, influenced and affected by demographic trends, the aging of population in the advanced countries, uh, the growth in the uh, population and the consequent demand for immigration and the offer of immigration from uh, various countries due to economic reasons or conflict. This is what Levi Bacci has already talked about long. I would just like to add that the ultimately what's important is how the whole process is governed. We need to have more work in an economy in which there's an increasingly lower number of people who work because of the aging population. The problem is how these people will be integrated, what they will do in view of uh, technological change, that technological change uh, that tend to reduce uh, the number of jobs which can be standardized uh, and how we can in a way absorb uh, people whose skills are not uh, so much in line with what is really needed by the system, who's, uh, who do not meet the, the demands of the system. There's lots of rhetoric when it comes to uh, to this problem. Italy has to face a huge humanitarian problem as a, an entry gate to Europe. But then in Italy, there's much less immigration than abroad. There's much less immigration than the level of immigration absorbed by other European countries like Germany. But then ultimately, one can see that out of the 140 million migrants, uh, in 2015, well, 60% of them came from developing countries, meaning that the remaining 40% will come from the very same developed countries. So there's a high level of uh, working mobility within the very same developed countries. And in Europe, over half of the migrants will come from the same region, namely Europe. So the corridor is actually a European internal corridor. Let us now move on to another topic, the financial topic. Uh, we also have problems linked to globalization and technological problem in the in technological change in the field of uh, financial sector. And we've had a number of problems here. The first episodes are the episodes of the economic and financial crisis of 2007 in the United States. Uh, then developed in 2008-2009, and then the crisis of sovereign uh, state debts uh, of 2012. Actually, there's a missing slide here, but I would like to focus a little bit on globalization linked to finance. Uh, so on the one hand, there was an explosion of the financial resources gathered from the, fin ma from the private market. And some tools, like derivatives, were used excessively. Uh, a life insurance is some kind of a derivative. So uh, we should talk about derivatives by understanding well what they really are. A derivative is a contract that enables us to uh, ensure a company 
against the uh, current uh, exchange, currency exchange rate um, fluctuations. This is a contract that can insure you with someone else who would like to be insured in the opposite term. For example, importers if from Europe, uh, importers into Europe and exporters from Europe. But many of these tools have then be uh, transformed into derivatives that uh, were not transparent and were one of the main reasons of the financial crisis. The costs of the crisis actually increased skepticism vis-a-vis -vis the financial world. This is this was nothing new. Finance has long been considered as a dubious. Uh, Away. Amartya Sen held a lecture in 1991 at the Bank of Italy and he wondered how uh, come that uh, such a useful activity was considered uh, as a doubtful uh, from an ethical point of view. The very same, uh, uh, in the very same Bible this was possible. For example, Solon in ancient Greek uh, uh, talked about that and Aristotle defined interests as the unjustified reproduction of money into money. So there, there was a structural uh, uh, lack of trust and everybody's attitude depends on the financial markets conditions in a given moment. Up to the 1970s of uh, the 20th century, the market failures would need the presence of a regulator. And then later on with the failure of the state, for example, inflation, stagflation, the emphasis shifted onto uh, bankruptcy and we were higher in uh, increase in uh, um, in liberalization since the 1990s uh, also new technologies increased uh, the speed in communication and the possibility of creating peculiar tools this led to a crisis that led to a renewed uh, regulation and today the talk uh, is uh, to go in the opposite direction too. so there's always been a negative perception of banks and finance this will continue being important in the future but this should not bring about an excessive reaction Amartya Sen also said that finance plays a very important role for the prosperity of nations and yet it is needed for lots of things it, it's needed to transfer resources over time uh, because we can save today, we can save money today to use it tomorrow. And then in terms of space, what you can uh, in save in one place can be used in another place. Much is done uh, for financial education. One needs, for example, to understand the difference between uh, risk and yield, but we shouldn't get so much eluded because this uh, is not enough to reduce the speculations of those who are well educated in financial terms. So what we need is to have an effective uh, regulation. We need uh, supervision and monitoring uh, and when this is not enough, well then justice must be quick and rigorous. The crisis highlighted the risks uh, coming from uh, the deregulation of financial markets. There's two additional elements I would like to mention. One uh, talks about the need uh, to distinguish between investment banks and trading banks, but there is a whole new form that needs to be regulated, which is the so-called shadow banking, the area of the shadow bank. In other words, an activity where you have financing, uh, um, that can have negative externalities, for example, hedge funds or institutional funds, uh, which are neither regulated in some countries nor uniformly regulated. And plus, there is a big uh, change which is currently underway and which takes advantage of the technological change. So the mass of available information has increased, big data is there, uh, there are infinite and extraordinary possibilities of using new technologies like the digital technologies and apply them to the finance world. These are new companies, we're talking about new companies which are growing and creating processes and models which are very innovative. 
they're not so much widespread, but they will be widespread uh, and in a massive way. So credits will be given almost automatically based on scores. And there will be an increase uh, of uh, cybersecurity related risks. Uh, cybersecurity is already a problem today, and it will become an even bigger problem when digitalization will be uh, pushed to the extremes. So we will have to get ready about that. I would like to finish off by talking about uh, what uh, um, we should do in the future. and work in the future. So the question we pose ourselves is whether in the second age, era of machines, uh, robots will uh, steal our work. There is a double problem of employment and income on the one hand and equity, uh, inequality, sorry, on the other hand. So there will be uh, a more income, but actually who will uh, capable of buying uh, the goods and services produced uh, uh, with automated techniques? And will it be possible for the results of a technological process uh, uh, not to benefit only the few? Uh, I tried to say a couple of things that, uh, on work. Uh, uh, but the issue of work, the issue of employment is uh, fundamental. It is at the very core of everything. It concerns uh, the identity of people and social integration as well. On an economic level, it is not only a conjunctural level because the potential, the growth potential of an economy depends on the very same quality and quantity of the workforce and the capacity of the productive system to employ uh, job seekers adequately. Uh, demographic and technological trends uh, play a fundamental role, and this role will become even more important in the future. Uh, replacing work with machines uh, is on a massive scale, is a phenomenon which takes place uh, on a massive scale today, and yet it is not a phenomenon that has impacted uh, significantly on job productivity. This uh, makes it possible for lots of economists to say that we can be quite optimistic. Or optimistic. So in other words, a technological unemployment is considered to be an, a temporary expression which is just, uh, uh, which takes place only as an adjustment uh, uh, in order to, in a way, find new ways of producing at a higher speed compared to the normal situation in which you can find new jobs. But actually the problem is uh, how long this transition period is. Looking at the past, the technological problem progress uh, has always generated more jobs than the one it destroyed, and even quite rapidly. Cars have, car production have given work to those who used to produce carts, for example. Today, the workforce is in increasing and there is a highly advanced, highly qualified elite, in, which is 10% in the United States, which works uh, on new technologies and gets high income. On the other hand, the remaining part of the population finds it difficult to make ends meet. This is partly due to a change in production techniques, uh, to the need of having uh, uh, qualified work, qualified jobs that replace the non-qualified ones, but then ultimately, all standardized uh, and, stun and, and jobs were replaced, and all the jobs that could be standardized were replaced. Uh, and for example, the distinction between abstract, highly innovative jobs uh, and the gap between highly uh, innovative jobs uh, carried out by very few people and lots of jobs which uh, cannot be standardized, uh, for example, taking care of the elderly or gardening works uh, and so on. These jobs uh, are still available as manual work at a low income, and the risk is that the uh, income will go even, uh, will, will, be, will be decreased. Uh, for example, there are people who work uh, in banks uh, as back, back office workers or they do routine works in factories. They will compete with this part of the population and they will probably, not all of them will be employed and on the other hand, they will contribute to reduce uh, 
pay to reduce wages. Technological progress, however, stimulates new possibilities, and some of them are cannot be even imagined. The farmers at the beginning of last century probably have uh, nephews today who are IT experts. They work who work with new technologies. They perform jobs that have to deal with uh, the information and communication technologies, works that were unthinkable a couple of years ago. So the world in which we will work in the next 30 to 40 years is very difficult to understand. But these innovations uh, interact with one another and they uh, give each other the possibility of uh, witnessing rapid technological change, rapid accelerations with uh, artificial intelligence processes and with the possibility for machines to learn with the Internet of Things, uh, the, and we don't know where this Internet of Things will end up, with the big data, and a whole series of activities that will uh, represent a world where we are called upon to live in a different way than we do today. So to conclude, this has a series of implications. It is impossible to foresee the future, but we need to change our perspective. And we need to understand that on the one hand, it is priority. It is a priority to reinforce our economy, and our economy must be better and quicker to uh, hook um, a technological process. On the other hand, we need to make sure for everybody to participate in this change and enjoy the benefits of this. And there are some uh, uh, for some aspects to face. I have four in mind. Vis-a-vis -vis the threat concerning unemployment, we cannot opt for the loudest way. We need to act on several fronts. We need to reinforce the innovation rate. We need to... And Calenda came here. So it is fundamental. This is fundamental. We faced the change brought about by technological change with a great delay. As early as in the 1990s, this was clear. Companies did not invest. They used the flexibility of the work market by reducing wages, by replacing those who would retire with young people, part-time with part-time works and flexible working formats. They reduced the costs of work, but they did not invest to incorporate the necessary innovations to produce in a different way and to produce different goods and services. And this is something that we need to do. We need to uh, speed up the exit of companies from the work market and actually make it less costly. It's not a problem to go bankrupt, but the fact is that one should do it at a, loss, at a lower cost. Just think about jobs in the requalification of our local areas or in um, uh, town modernization in the enhancement and promotion of uh, Italy's cultural er heritage. I've been saying these things for many, many years on the occasion of this uh, uh, end of year presentation. It is quite odd that it is the government uh, of the Bank of Italy who says exactly these things. But then every year we face illegal building, problems like illegal building, or uh, old towns which are not uh, modern, uh, modernized. These are things that can produce a lot of uh, work, also traditional work. The effectiveness of any effort in a relaunch phase will be limited if we do not improve the context where companies work at the same time. And there's a number of areas where investments, long-term investments, uh, can be made, including, for example, protecting legality and the efficiency of public services. Uh, the second uh, major topic refers to the organization of uh, working times. Vis-a-vis -vis several decades ago, uh, the time uh, devoted to work has uh, decreased. Um, young people enter the labor market later, uh, at a later age. Uh, the part-time work uh, um, has been widespread and, uh, and there are... Um, uh, more uh, retired people now uh, in 
following the technological innovation, probably we will uh, tend to reduce the um, input of work needed for the reduction of goods and services. So it will be necessary to find mechanisms to allocate uh, working times and working hours so that everybody can participate in the productive process. Training periods will have to be um, alternated with um, uh, time devoted to work. And then we should also focus on the distribution of resources. And this is a topic that was debated by Piketty uh, at Concerns. We may agree uh, or not with their uh, thesis. Uh, uh, at times they are controversial, but uh, certainly there is a double problem, uh, that of demand and that of equity. On the one hand, if the technological innovation will lead to uh, a reduction of opportunities for work and wages, income from work, uh, the question is who will buy these goods and services produced by machines? And then uh, will it be sustainable for the results of uh, progress to uh, go to the hands of a few, just a few people? If this will be the case, um, we're going to witness a pressure towards the uh, redistribution of wealth. And it's better for us to start thinking about it now. It's not uh, going to be the problem of one individual nation. It's going to be a problem of the entire Europe, at least. Finally, it is also needed, uh, faced uh, with the technological progress and uh, a longer uh, working life, it is necessary for uh, working people to combine traditional uh, knowledge, standardized knowledge, which remain fundamental. I'm referring to history, mathematics, uh, um, history of the arts and sciences, etc. But uh, these have to go hand in hand with a new set of competences and skills that can be um, used to face um, uh, unprecedented situation. Uh, in the past, uh, the skills of the past were those that you can see in the left-hand side of the slide. That was uh, Charlemagne. Uh, he was two meters tall. He didn't know how to read and write, but he was strong in the battles and he was a warrior. Then, reading and writing were the necessary skills to make progress. Now, uh, skills required in the 21st century are different. And the skills required uh, need to be um, used to face unprecedented a uh, new situation, such as uh, uh, exercising uh, uh, critical thought, creativity, uh, being able to solve problems, uh, uh, positive um, readiness to accept innovation, the capacity to communicate to uh, the uh, skill to collaborate and to work in a team. These are not new competencies, but uh, they are going to have a decisive role, and they are already having a decisive role in the organization of uh, jobs and works. An education system that can uh, provide this kind of com skills to as, um, as many students as possible is a challenge for Italy, and it should also be a commitment for the public sector and for the uh, private sector. Uh, I'm referring to families who should be willing to invest in lifelong education, and Italy um, is lagging behind. Yet having the skills for the 21st century is one of the uh, prerequisites to face the uncertain um, period that lies ahead of us. And the um, uncertain elements uh, which will... Um, make the, which will characterize the jobs in the future. We need to have the necessary tools to be able to survive. Uh, so we need to know the situation. And we uh, need to focus on uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a recent uh, uh, movie, Facebook, two twins, uh, a protest against the um, uh, chancellor of Harvard, a great economist, and they tell him, well, somebody and somebody stole us our idea. So they kept protesting that, well, at the end, uh, Zuckerberg will uh, give them money, some hundred millions. But the interesting aspect is um, what Summer said, the chancellor. And he says, well, it's weird. Today, in Harvard, students believe that inventing a job is better than finding a job. 
But this is interesting, and it is the aptitude which is, uh, and the attitude which is different. Uh, the world is changing globally, and this change requires uh, a different uh, uh, attitude towards jobs. Digitalization is an opportunity, so the potential should be grasped and the extraordinary outstanding impact should be governed, uh, because impact may also be negative. This means not opposing the free exchange, free um, market, uh, free exchanges of goods, not uh, focusing on protectionism just because of rhetoric, it is important to state this today, but it is also important to remember that managing globalization requires greater attention towards those who are um, slower. Um, a topic which has been long neglected in the G7, in the G20, at national level and at European level. Faced with the destruction of old um, jobs and the creation of new jobs, I think the state has the obligation to, to offer a protective network, um, a sort of a safety net to those who uh, lose their jobs and uh, it should also guarantee uh, education so as to be able to find another job. And to the young people who have the, uh, the task, the most stimulating task, studying, investing in their knowledge, in their skills in order to have the necessary human capital to be able to exploit the opportunities uh, created and give their own contribution to the creation of a better world. This is my uh, closing remark. Investment in knowledge pays the best interest. This is what Benjamin Franklin wrote uh, uh, almost 300 years ago. Benjamin Franklin is one of the founding fathers of the US. He was a publisher, a scientist, a politician. The um, return on investments in knowledge is uh, the highest. And so the root of human and social progress, the precondition for the economic uh, development, and it is even more so today than it was in the past. Thank you very much. So, uh, the interesting aspect is that this enormous upheaval, in the end, have something at their core, which should not be taken for granted, the investment in knowledge. From this point of view, we have a question by Luca Fare, student of the last year of economics, uh, economic studies at the Catholic University in Milan. And this question focuses on uh, the fact of knowing in order to be able to uh, act and to change. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Governor. Uh, my name is Luca. I study economics at the Catholic University of the Holy Heart in Milan. Over the last few years, while I was studying, I um, I recognize that this change does not, is not sparing anyone, not even the university where I study. In particular, I note a subtle contrast between a world which is increasingly globalized, as you said, which requires a greater opening and a discipline, a topic such as economics, which on the one hand is getting more and more specialistic in the various components, so macroeconomy, uh, microeconomy, statistics, technology, and it is more and more difficult for me to understand the relationship between these aspects. On the other hand, it seems to me that it is forgetting uh, the historical dimension, which is a fundamental aspect and uh, the uh, well, history is less and less thought at universities. It seems to me that the main concern now, of, and I'm referring to many economists, is that of using uh, tools to demonstrate that with economics and mathematics you can demonstrate everything, rather than putting this knowledge uh, to the service of the common good. And this, to me, means um, admitting that you cannot demonstrate everything only by a mathematical model. So my question revolves around this aspect, um, how intelligence and technique which are needed to, do, um, to be a good economist 
can uh, be used to uh, to be uh, more um, uh, careful uh, on some aspects uh, in order to favor uh, an opening to all the aspects which are of interest to us. Well, it's a complex question, and I need to answer uh, humbly. On the one hand, clearly, it is true, there is a trend towards uh, um, uh, towards specialization, and it leads uh, to well, some very important people to to make questions. For for instance, the uh, Queen Elizabeth asked the economists why uh, they did not have uh, predicted the uh, financial crisis. Uh, all the aspects you mentioned. Uh, refer to uh, refers to the instruments uh, to face the problems. History is fundamental. Uh, the knowledge of society, the ability to um, apply formally one's own ideas, um, how uh, companies interact with the workers. and the use of data, of information, which are uh, more and more uh, difficult to be organized. They may be organized in a, an automatic way, or but they must be organized and seen and understood by the researcher with the necessary attention in order to avoid mechanistic uh, attitudes. And so the, the ability to use statistics as a tool, these are all tools that need to, to be uh, used together. Obviously, for each of them, we need to have somebody studying them in depth and considering with as many details as possible the models with which uh, it is possible to interpret uh, a particular specific phenomena and combine uh, certain variables. So having the entire framework and scenario uh, as a whole um, before us, well, is extremely complicated, uh, although it would be useful. And it is also difficult to interact with those who are in charge of uh, decision making. On the one hand, I would say it is very important uh, for us to have uh, experts and scholars in mathematics, statistics, uh, those who study macroeconomics, uh, uh, general um, economic uh, balance, uh, um, well-being related uh, economy. Uh, there may be lots of specializations uh, because in this way you can uh, you can define in depth the the tools available, um, and these tools can then be used for uh, decision making. But on the other hand, we need to be careful not to make confusion, not to confuse models, which are the products of these tools, with the reality. In the end, a model is a, a sort of an approximation of the real world. And for those of you who are familiar with mathematics, it is a linear approximation, but the world changes in a non-linear way. And certainly, it does not change in a deterministic way. It changes in, uh, well, in a casual, at random. Uh, it is not possible to predict how the world will change. Uh, uh, and so, it, we, do, we must not think that uh, since the world is changing in a different way than that uh, envisaged by the models, the world is wrong. This is not the, the right way of thinking. It's a philosophical problem. You need to have this aptitude. But you should also be humble enough. We should also be humble enough because we must acknowledge the fact that it is not possible to know all. And we need to analyze all the data that we have at our disposal. And this is a very tiresome process. I believe that the economist is like um, the uh, craftsman 
who uses the tools and the materials and his own know-how to be able uh, to uh, produce uh, and to make a product which is uh, useful to everybody. It is a very tiresome uh, process and uh, uh, a very difficult process. I would like to ask... Uh, I'd like to ask another question, one last question. What kind of human attitude should we have vis-à-vis uh, -vis this changing world and vis-à-vis -vis the crisis? Uh, uh, we Italians in the first place, uh, and especially, I mean, you, as you have uh, such an important, you hold such an important profile compared to this crisis. So in other words, what, what kind of uh, attitude should we have? Should, be, should we be afraid of this? Well, I, I asked a, a booklet, I, I wrote, sorry, a booklet uh, some time ago. The final sentence in the cover is uh, seizing opportunities and uh, not uh, uh, fearing only the risks of change. We, as a, a society, are a very conservative society. First of all, because most of us are old, I'm almost 70. And actually, I don't like so much to go and risk again. And yet, we need to do it. We need to question ourselves. And plus, we live in a company that is constantly changing. In the last few decades, uh, uh, society changed at a very high speed, and I think we will uh, uh, stop. On the one hand, we need to be curious enough to understand what's there. Uh, young people have to be curious. They have to put together very different things. On the other hand, we need to be humble and at the same time respectful towards society and the others. We shouldn't shout. We shouldn't use any slogans. We shouldn't be superficial. We have Twitter now, but actually behind Twitter, there's lots of things which go more in depth than Twitter. And you can see them only if you can uh, analyze in depth. Only in that way can you understand how this can be done. So much of the difficulty we have in going out of the crisis lies in this uh, tendency to be superficial. After all, everybody can be, uh, uh, so to say, the trainers of the national soccer team we choose our best 11 soccer players and then actually ask why the trainer doesn't do it. Well, apart from the fact that we're not capable of doing that, but when you manage economic policy, it's not exactly the same. This is very important to bear in mind. So before expressing a view, one should go more in depth, and I think this is the only attitude you should have in facing change. Well, I think that this last uh, remark is actually the way we should consider to look at this uh, meeting with Mr. Visco. First of all, we should know. In one hour, we uh, had a lecture, and globally, we learned what's going on. And actually, much work is needed for this, much humble work, much work of analysis. Getting knowledge, obtaining knowledge requires this kind of obscurity, this apparent uselessness. I was talking to the guys uh, working at the parking places yesterday and also to the ones uh, who actually write the news of minor meetings. And the, their question was, what is it for? Why should we have a parking place? Or why should we communicate meetings uh, with briefs that nobody will uh, read? But actually, from this dark, obscure work, uh, we can have the analysis showed by the governor. In order to have a non-superficial synthesis from Twitter, you need to have a lot of information. You need to gather them. You need to watch them spend some time in this activity. It's not easier now that we have more information. Uh, I'm a statistician by profession. In the past, we had a sample with few data, with limited data. Now we, you've got plenty of data. But how can you choose? How can you select the data that we need? 
uh, we need to have tools. So the first lesson we learn is this love for our work. Also the work that apparently is useless. This apparently useless work is the first tool of knowledge. The second is the ability of uh, summarizing this synthesis analysis. In order to develop this uh, capacity to summarize, and we've learned that uh, from a person that apparently had nothing to do with that, we learned that from former Minister for Education, Mr. Berlinsguer. Uh, he said, I would add uh, music and arts in all of our schools. What do they have to do with that? Actually, art taste makes you to think, to understand what you can choose. You have to have an artistic taste in order to have these uh, uh, slides with the right focus on the right information. What does the artist do? The artist actually exactly grasps the points which can actually um, hit reality. We have here. So the artist is capable of getting the right nuance, right sound. We heard the right, we heard Madama Butterfly from the Chinese orchestra. So those synthetic elements and the taste for beauty stems from the ability to summarize. So you can get that specific aspect. And the third thing is another uh, thing, patient, patience and time. When preparing this encounter, he told me that it would be interesting to have a policy which is not longer limited to a legislature, to have something that goes over time. It takes time. It takes patience to have a change of time, as like our farmers did when they uh, cleaned the riverbeds, or when they, for example, worked in nature and did things that were not immediately productive. They would build for those who would come afterwards. Cleaning a riverbed, cleaning a torrent would mean impeding, uh, preventing a, a flood in the future. Planting a tree on a hill would prevent uh, a landslide after years. And today we need to build for the future, for our children, for our nephews. We need to be patient enough to accept the crisis as an opportunity without uh, expecting results to be immediate in order to have uh, Italy that used to be at the productive top, uh, that used to be a leader. We had lots of people who migrated, uh, who made sacrifices, lots of people who actually uh, renounced uh, food to give it to their children. They have to do the same. We have to have this taste uh, for long run, long term uh, building. I think these three things uh, can help us appreciate this work, learn it, and build not only for tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but rather uh, in order to become the factors uh, and the decisive factors of this change of time. At the end of this cycle, we would like to become uh, those who will be remembered uh, as we now remember the monks of uh, thousand years ago. So not only from a religious point of view, but also from a productive point of view. The ones who, for example, invented uh, crop rotation, the ones who taught us how to breed animals. That apparently seemed to be useless. They would live for 40 years in places forgotten by God and man. But as we implemented a positive change uh, after barbarians, actually, it was exactly because of this. We want to be uh, lay people, and we want to be there, uh, so to say, the ones who imitate them, the ones who, thanks to this analytical work with this obesity, with this patience, uh, the ones who are able to build a better future. This is the hope and the work that lies ahead.